Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, also, I, I'm not quite sure if we're a double act, um, uh, but Gavin's going to talk to you guys about a lot of things. So I'm going to touch on certain aspects, <laughs> and um, Gavin's going to clean up with pretty much everything else. So um, this is a report uh, we did a little while ago, uh, a couple of months ago. And this is spending on construction in the UK. And what do you know? Archaeology jobs pretty much correlate with spending on construction. Um, we've all kind of known this. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, I was the first one to actually look at the numbers and put it through some uh, statistical analysis. Uh, but what this basically means is the vast majority of us have no control over our jobs. The vast majority of us base most of our work on what's happening in construction. And we are not any drivers of construction. So what's happening is basically we go through a boom and bust every couple of years. And that's completely driven by construction, which you could possibly say is also driven by your politicians. So I guess we're kind of at fault for voting them in. But essentially what we do is we go through boom and bust cycles. And that is horrible for most archaeologists. Uh, one, when you're going through a bust, as I'm assuming most of us have, have been through, it really sucks. I mean, you just can't get any jobs. Um, it's really stressful. And how many good archaeologists do we lose? How many people who are, are really good at innovation have simply left the profession because there's no jobs for them? And then conversely, when we go through these booms, we suck up all our talent. I, I, I can't think of how many illustrators, specialists, finds people get put out in the field. Because all of a sudden, we need archaeologists. We need people out there digging. And we suck up all our talent and put them right out into the field. And that's you know, a way of keeping people employed. Because then when the, the bus comes, we, you know, we go back, we do all the post -ex. But you're taking people out of their specialism and you're putting them in the field. I know illustrators who have spent the last two or three years out in the field and all they want to do is draw. And not like a cross section, they really just want to look at some artifacts and draw and do plans. Uh, but they're basically constantly out there. We basically right now, um, for the first time, we're actually seeing a really high increase in archaeologists coming from other countries because we just don't have enough here in the UK. And so that's a real problem. And basically, we have no control over this. And it's all coming from, essentially, the private sector. So uh, if you guys see over there, essentially, public funding, infrastructure, it's been flat. It's been flat for a couple of years. We're actually down a bit. Housing, housing, big private developments, that's all that's happening. And that's driving all of us. And you, that could be a drive for innovation. That's a lot of money going around. Uh, but I wonder if, you know, when the good times happen, do we really care to innovate because we have work? And when the bad times come, do we actually still have enough money or resources to try to do innovation, to try to keep our jobs? Um, basically, the numbers we look at is no, we don't. Um, every time there's a slump, basically, we just kick people out of the profession. Um, and that's how we work. Um, and I guess you could call this the sort of the quick death. Because archaeology has also a problem with the slow death. <laughs> this, this graph right here in green are the number of PhD students in archaeology. And in blue and red are the number of new academic jobs each year. Each year, about we lose your, your chance of getting an academic job goes down about 1 or 2%. Um, compared to, you know, there's going to be 200 uh, PhD students for maybe 20 new positions each year. Pardon me. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of postdocs and researchers, and you, know, you can do that for a couple of years. But in terms of actually having a career, there's only a limited number. And it really has not gone up. And so in other parts of archaeology, essentially, it's getting harder and harder and harder. But we don't realize it. It happens so slowly that there's not that moment. There's not that moment where you're being kicked out and said, OK, you need to find your way in the world. You need to do innovation. You need to do a job. Uh, so a bust can have that advantage. 
and that when you have a bust, suddenly you have to make your way. That idea you wanted to try but have you know not done it because you had a stable job, well, you don't have that anymore, so you give it a go. But in a lot of areas of the sector, we're slowly bleeding ourselves dry. And this is not just uh, academia. If you look at basically pretty much any government archaeologist, slowly, slowly cutting them. And it's, it's happening bit by bit. Half job here, another half job there. Uh, but it happens so slow that there's no pressure to innovate. You just slowly die. Um, and so that's, that's our, our problems. We both have a problem of some parts of archaeology are slowly dying and there's no pressure to innovate. And then other areas, it's just boom and bust. Um, and the boom tends to drag away resources from innovation. Um, and the bust, well, we've all been through that and it really sucks. Um, I wish I was ending on like a, a happier note, um, <laughs> but uh, these, these are, uh, these are all, the, all the things that are keeping us down. So hopefully the happy note will be us discussing and finding ways around it. Uh, so I'll hand over to Gavin to I kick off. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I was feeling quite positive at the end of the class. Yeah, thank you. I don't, I don't know if I'll be the happy note. Um, I'll just, just get my slide up. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, thank you, Lisa. It, it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, to be honest, I'm trying to work through a few issues in the you know, short time I've got. And um, I'll be interested in how you respond. Um, what I'm going to present is the results of thinking through changing practice myself over years. Um, so I won't necessarily use broad caricatures about certain parts of the sector. I won't apologise for that in a sense because there are distinctions. Um, and just to brighten things up, I decided this morning to interweave some slides that are a bit more visual of people doing things. Um, but that, in a sense, those images capture the spirit of some of the things I'm talking about. And they also, I should acknowledge, are possible through the work of funding of bodies like Historic Environment Scotland, HLF, Robertson Trust, organisations that are funding other kinds of outcome in different ways. So I should explain from the context before I really get into it that coming from Scotland, we have a different framework. We have a, a we would now say a level of maturity, I think, with the national performance framework in terms of government's sort of agendas. And the historic environment and archaeology um, strategies articulate with that in due course, and it should appear more in due course. So that, that's very good for us to work uh, across the sector in different ways, and that increasingly is happening. But I was asked to think a little bit about inhibitors. What inhibitors inhibit innovation? So um, you've heard people talk about barriers. There's breakages as well. We're clearly hearing about breakages. Different parts of the sector that don't articulate through certain pressures. And, and those are genuine issues and genuine concerns for us. Um, we've heard already about values, and I would argue we are currently articulating a very low value proposition. I'll come back to that. But then there's also something fundamental to all of us in this room, the perceptual barriers. What is it we do? What is our motivation? And I'll come to this in further detail. So ontological, our being, who are we? And when we get up every day as an archaeologist, what does that mean? And then disciplinary. I get confused with these conversations. Do you mean archaeology for the little a or the big a? We keep talking about archaeology, and I keep imagining being in the trench again, like I used to enjoy doing. And actually, most of you in the room in different ways are articulating in ways that aren't simply archaeology. So I'll come to some of these things in further detail. Just keep me on time. <laughs> um, yeah, innovation. So, Again, others have touched on it. What is it? Why are we innovate? Grow markets, try and buy certain things, increase our margins. We can certainly do that in certain parts of the sector, it wouldn't hurt. Uh, develop audiences, we've heard that mentioned. Who are our audiences? Why do we have audiences? Why would we want to grow them? And again, learn more about the class. Now, the point being is, each one of us may answer differently what our purpose is. And we can only innovate, I would argue, with purpose, with intent, with focus. And actually, the two stereotypes of our practices is what I'm concerned with. What's the mission and vision of the sector? Currently, we operate through two lenses that dominate 
what we do. And I'll come back to this. We hear the commercial phrase being used a lot, and then we have the issue of knowledge production, which we'll hear us discuss quite a lot. So fine, there's a reason for that. There is a, a, a reason why our discipline has emerged and become. And for each one of us, how you answer these questions should be your ontology, your motivation, your purpose. And it will be different for each one of us and different for each part of the sector. We love our field work, doing it with people makes them happy too. But our discipline has transformed and continues to transform and change. And in certain parts of the work we do, we talk about managing change through the spatial planning system. So managing change in our sector is fundamental. In the good old days, I just don't take my spade and find some nice treasure. It's great, I put it in my collection, my cabinet. And then of course we awaken to the reality that it wasn't simply the object, there was something more fundamental that these collections, these remains of the past could allow us to access and converse about more broadly. And then, in the 80s when it was realised, huge amounts of archaeology was being bulldozed away without any response. A model was put in place in recognition of other legislation, with other policy <laughs> development about the polluter paying principles. Great, well done. Fantastic step forward. But the challenges we face as a society, the challenges we face as a world, perhaps we should be rethinking some of these object and output focused practice. Nice cheerful picture. If it's interested, <laughs> this is my shadow. <laughs> so, what do we do? We mediate pastness, sorry for the strange phrase, but we intersect in so many ways it isn't simply archaeology. So my equation of what we are actually doing, archaeology, historic environment, cultural heritage, policy, practices, methods, <laughs> and they all intersect. And in each of these contexts there are different value propositions that should articulate more widely. Often I hear the discussion about the value propositions being through two sets of lenses. A cheerful one, medieval clay oven, it's tricky. So we are broad, but we're narrow, I would argue. We have this unique encounter, we have this moment, this responsibility that we mediate the society of what we talk about is trying to produce knowledge. And we have a formulaic set of methodologies where, as we heard in some just papers and presentations this morning, there'll be half a dozen academic volumes that will sit there on the shelf languishing. But we know with the historic environment, cultural heritage, policy and practice, we articulate with social, economic, cultural and environmental issues, where we are actively participating in the creation of different values. And 90% of that funding through the commercial model only plays to knowledge production. It doesn't play to other value propositions and other forms of value creation that are relevant in social, economic, cultural and environmental terms. And I think that's a real challenge for us as we go forward. Chuck in the digital dimension, digital heritage, and how we can transform data sets, print off objects, you know, the times we live in are remarkable. So, new modern archaeologies, is that where the innovation comes from? Uh, we reference back to my taste in 80s music, so there you go. So, beyond Fordian production lines, you know, the sauce machines of price them low and stack them high. What well, if we go to design archaeologies? What well, if we actually use our skill sets to tailor things in every set of circumstances that we see other disciplines doing? Fourth sector models, the alignment of shared interest through commercial, social, research agendas. It's happening there, it's bubbling under the surface. So we can talk about our formulation of how archaeology, historic environment, and cultural heritage contributes to other outcomes. That's the agenda that's out there, and we're not really playing to it. So, a few options, a few opportunities we've heard touched on before. <coughs> Just to take it forward in a little positive mode. Yes, we've already heard Jeff mentioning that, you know, we need to find space to imagine. And what are our shared goals? What does our purpose take us to? Policy development, it's happening, but we should be part of that process, and advocacy, for what? taking risks, 
It is not failure, it's just a process of learning and change. Trialing and prototyping and collaborative co-production. These are all ways that we can work in partnership and work in a way that addresses some of these bigger challenges. So it's there already in the academic sector, we know that, the REP agenda. Transdisciplinary research, addressing problems. How does that transform what we do? Even in the commercial sector, there's pressures now to drive us for ethical procurement about social delivery through those contracts. And then the social enterprise model, which transforms business in different ways. So all the bits of the jigsaw are there. It's happening out there, but we're stuck in very simplified models, I would argue. It's inhibiting because we see we're either knowledge producers or we're servicing clients. We need to focus on the customers who use our products in due course and the values they're looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you.